Welcome back to the Jack Swarbrick Show, and we're honored to have as our next guest, Mike Mayock, who is the uh, football draft maven, I guess you could call him, for <laughs> the NFL Network. Many of you will know him as the longtime uh, analyst on the Notre Dame football broadcasts on NBC, a, a job he transitioned out of a, a few years ago. Uh, many of you also know he was a Boston College graduate. You were a star at Boston. Some of the younger folks may not know that. So I want to talk about your career at BC to start just a little bit. You notice the hat, don't you? Yeah. Well, absolutely. I'm walking proud here at Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, where is Swarbrick? I mean, this is his show. Is that what you're telling me? It's his show, but, you know, he's big. So every now and then. Yeah, you, but if it has get... your name on it, you tell Jack that I think he ought to be here. <laughs> I mean, if, if your name's on it, you've got to answer the oh, bell. Oh, he'll see this. You've got to answer the bell, Jack. This gets posted, and all his friends will see this. Good, he'll good. Get, he'll An- get Jack, to... you need to answer the bell, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about when you, when you went back to BC. First of all, you didn't get to play Notre Dame. Um, right before you went to BC, and I grew up in Boston as well. I remember one of the first games at Schaefer Stadium mm-hmm. uh, was a Notre Dame game yeah. uh, with a huge traffic jam. What was your view, though, when you were playing at BC of Notre Dame? Well, to take a step back, the game you're, you're referring to, I think it was 3-3 three to three at halftime, and I was a high school junior mm-hmm. trying to, and getting recruited heavily by Boston College and trying to figure out how good BC was or wasn't. I didn't know much about them. My dad was my high school coach. So my dad and I are watching Notre Dame BC, and it's halftime 3-3, three to three, and we're thinking, hey, BC's for real. They're hanging with Notre Dame. I think it ended up 17-3, to three, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. Notre Dame. But that was my first kind of blush with Boston College and Notre Dame. And uh, my senior year, BC recruited me really heavily. Notre Dame didn't come after me at all. Um, And from my perspective, I got to Boston College, and Notre Dame was that other Catholic school that got a lot more attention than we did that that I had a little bit of grudge against because we didn't get to play them, which I would have loved to. We didn't get to play Penn State, which I really wanted to play because I'm a Pennsylvania kid. So really the two schools I wanted to play, we didn't get a chance to play in my time at BC. But I always had a healthy respect for Notre Dame. The game we're referring to, 1975, I know for sure. I think it was Labor Day night. Uh, I also remember the huge traffic jam because it was one of the first games at then Schaefer Stadium, which is near where the current Gillette Stadium is. That series resumed uh, in the early 80s because I was actually calling the games on local TV then, and it was a big deal when those two teams got together. But you had a pretty good career as a defensive back at Boston College. You're one of those guys uh, who was so talented you got to do other things. You threw one pass in college. And it went for a touchdown. You remember that? Actually, threw two. Really? Yeah. I just checked the stats. I didn't have the other one. Probably because it was an extra point. I'm guessing. Okay. All right. Uh, so, All right. Was, so I was two for two really? as a thrower unofficially, but I was a high school quarterback, so I held extra points. I returned punts. So even though I was a safety, I did a lot of stuff, and I also played in the baseball team, and uh, that's what I loved. I was. I ended up playing both football and baseball, and uh, to me, that was in the old days. I mean. It, I get frustrated when I see eight- and nine-year-old kids starting to specialize. I was going to ask you that. I really do. And uh, at at this point in my life when I'm evaluating athletes, I even like the athletes that play different sports because I think they're a better rounded athlete and understand team sports even better. You also rushed for a touchdown. Do you remember that one? Uh, It was against Villanova and Howie Long because Howie. Yeah, Howie was my one of my recruits, and he at the last minute he switched from BC to Villanova, and I was supposed to be the blocking back on the play. The coach called it incorrectly. He called it the the, the mirror, so I ended up with the ball, and my roommate ended up having to block for me, which was really funny. And to this day, we laugh about it. You did go on to a, a pro career. You played nine games for the New York Giants in '82 and '83, uh, and, and then what happens to a lot of folks? Uh, the body didn't hold up, yeah. and that ended your career. Yeah, I, I tore a knee in 83 and missed a lot of the season. Came back in 84, re-injured it, and actually tore both ACLs. So going in, in the 84 season, I, I blew out both of my ACLs. Uh, and so at a very young age, I realized that my career was over, and thankfully I had a really good academic background and a degree from Boston College. But you never lost your love of football. And again, in broadcasting, you appear. And folks just assume you went from playing football to broadcasting, right? Uh, and, and even folks that don't have, and you had an outstanding athletic career. I mean, even people don't realize how hard it is to play at that next level. How many great players never have a long mm-hmm. career or even get the, the chance? Right. Uh, but folks who may not even have that career think you just go, you graduate from your college TV or radio station, and you go right to ESPN. You fought hard to get to where you are now, yeah. and it took a while. Well, if you're a Hall of Fame type player, a Pro Bowl type player, uh, big name coach. You can retire and walk right into ESPN or the NFL Network or any Fox, any of that. And that, that's, all, that's fine. 
Uh, but if you're not a big name player, then you've got to do it a different way. And basically, when I got hurt, it was one of those things where I wasn't sure if I was going to be done. Two ACLs back in the day were tough for a defensive back to come back from, but I, I still wanted to work out and try it again. So I didn't want to make a career choice while I was still rehabbing. And to make a long story short, you know, all of a sudden you're 25, 26 years old, and you realize it's over, and you got to go get a job. You got to, you know, and I started in commercial real estate and got married and all, you know, a couple of years later, kids come along and all the rest of it. So you're, you're really working hard trying to make everything work at home. Uh, but I never lost the whole football thing. My dad was a coach. My, all four of my brothers played college football. You know, we, so we kind of grew up that way and it was in my blood. So uh, eventually I started doing high school games on the radio for free, just volunteering my services. I did New Jersey Network as a sideline reporter. I interviewed that Princeton Tiger more times than I want to tell you, the, mas- the mascot. I mean, I interviewed moms, dads, mascots. It was, I mean, for a guy that thinks he's a football guy, that was horrible. That was yeah. awful. But you have to put your time in, and I did. And uh, slowly made my way to ESPN as a sideline reporter. Again, they said I didn't have a big enough name to be in the booth. So I did Canadian games. I did arena football games. They slowly transitioned me into some low-level college games. So for almost uh, 18 years, basically, I did a bunch of stuff before I got the break when uh, NFL Network came along. And when NFL Network came along, it, it luckily for me, they didn't know how to do the draft. Heck, I didn't know how to do the draft. But they, they needed somebody that could go after the draft, and they figured I was the guy. Well, and it shows your love of it because I will speculate and don't want a definitive answer, but during those years fighting to get back to a network, the bulk of your living was made in your commercial real estate oh, yeah. deal. Not in what, And even now, you probably could be making a lot more if you stayed in commercial real estate than what you do now. Yeah, I, I, did, I was very fortunate in commercial real estate, became a partner at a fairly young age, and therefore I had equity in the deals we were putting together. So I was doing okay, and when I took the NFL Network job, I took a huge pay yep. cut. To, to go full-time in football. And a lot of my, my friends thought I was crazy, and I was like, you know what? It's the best decision I ever made. I have always tremendously admired you and the few others who do what you do in how you are able to keep track of hundreds and hundreds of athletes and be able to recall them. I mean, you do a draft show. It's a seven-hour show. Yeah. And you can't sit there and have 700 file cards and go through them. You've got to know all these guys. How do you do that? You know, my dad, again, he was my high school coach. He told me from a very young age I, w- I was a visual learner. And when I watched film of somebody, and this goes back to high school football, when, when, when he and my dad and I would watch film of the next opponent, apparently I had a great recall of all the numbers. Like I could tell him what the defensive backs were, what the strong side linebacker was, the weak side end. I just had a pretty good feel watching film, and it stayed with me. And when I started doing the draft work, the hardest part were the names because I could sit there and say, hey, 81, you know, 81 did this and 77 tried to block 81, 80, because I remember that's how, and that's how coaches are. That's how players are. It's, it's numbers based. So what I really had to learn was I had to tie a name to 81. And uh, the funny thing is that I've kind of always just stayed number based though. And, and I, when I think back, it's always to the tape I saw, to what the guy looked like physically, how did he look, and that, that's what triggers all the information in my head. Well, we're fortunate that uh, you are coming directly from Notre Dame's Pro Day over in the Loftus Center, uh, and so we're going to take advantage of sure. all that research you do. Now, the players' level of participation in the Pro Day yeah. varied, but you've been following all these guys for a long time, and including the ones uh, that went to the Combine. So let's start with the guy that everybody in the country is talking about, Deshaun Kaiser, both what you saw today and your overall impressions of him? It's all what I expected to see, and, and that is, uh, you know, he's 6'4 and a half, 235 pounds. He's what today's NFL wants in a quarterback, franchise-type quarterback, size. All his physical traits match up. He's got a big arm. He's athletic enough. He, he's a pocket thrower. He's a smart kid. He could be a leader of a franchise, a face of a franchise. So when you start from that premise, it gets the NFL excited. Now, I think there's some inconsistencies in his game, and you see it on game tape, and and you watch him for three quarters, and he makes a bunch of great throws, and then all of a sudden, a couple of bad ones. Lack of accuracy. His feet aren't tying to his upper body. 
Um, and I think what he and his quarterback coach, uh, Zach Robinson, were working on since the season ended is that footwork, really working hard on the footwork. You could see it today. NFL footwork's completely different than college. So he's got to learn five, five with a hitch, seven step, all the movement stuff. He looked really good on the movement stuff. So what I saw today really mirrored what I saw during the season. When he gets his feet, hips, shoulders all lined up, it's beautiful. Ball comes out as good as anybody can throw a football. However, when he gets a little bit out of sync, the ball sails or tails or whatever, and you see that inaccurate throw. So he's got to get more consistent, and he's working on it. He's doing a nice job working on it. I would love to see him get in a situation where he didn't have to start day one, and he had a quarterback in his late 30s that's had a great career and he could learn from. You know, Carson Palmer in Arizona, Drew Brees in New Orleans. One of those situations where he could sit for a year or two and just sponge it all up, work on his footwork, and and hopefully two to three years from now be a heck of a quarterback. Which teams are you hearing right now are really high on him? I think all the teams are that are quarterback needy for whatever reason, whether it's today or a year or two from now, are looking at him. And I think they're doing the same thing I am. I wouldn't bang the, a year ago today. I would have banged the table for Carson Wentz all day long. I was all in on Carson Wentz. I don't have a quarterback this year that I'm all in on. Okay, and most of the NFL teams don't either. So the process we're going through right now is I saw Watson at his pro day last week. I saw Trubisky at his two days ago. I saw Kaiser today. I'm going to see Mahomes next week at Texas Tech. I'm not going to be able to get to Cal to see the kid at Cal Webb, but I'm doing the same thing the NFL teams are doing, and and that is, yeah, we want to see him throw, but you really want to meet the kid and spend time with him. You want to have dinner with him. You want to put him up on the board, watch tape with him, and challenge what he knows or doesn't know. And I think to answer your question, finally, I think all the teams are trying to grind these kids a little bit to see who they want as the face of their franchise, and I don't think any of them know yet. So uh, fans always have their own self-interest at heart, even if they say they don't. So for fans who thought Deshaun should come back and wanted him back next year, from what you just told me and what else I've read, he made the right decision coming out now. Well, you know, I'm a little bit old school, and I think all these quarterbacks this year are not ready. So Watson had a year left. Trubisky had a year left. Kaiser has a year left. My heart... My gut tells me I wish these kids, you know, Sean, Deshaun's leaving here as a 12 and 11 as a starter, as a Notre Dame quarterback. That, that's not good enough, you know? And obviously they were 4 and 8 last year, but I would have loved to have seen him just say, I'm going to grab this program right now and we're going to go chase a national championship. Now, it's a different world today. And if you think you're going to go in the first round, gosh, I'd be the last one to say, stay. So I have conflicting emotions about all these quarterbacks because last year when, like I said, when um, Carson Wentz came out, I knew he was ready. It was easy. Mm -hmm. Those four quarterbacks I just mentioned, none of them are ready. So it's hard to put a first-round grade on a quarterback when you know he's not going to play for at least a year. But there's a likelihood that some of those guys are going to go in the first round. Oh, there is. They're, They're being artificially pushed up. And the higher you go, if you're a top 10 pick, there's an awful lot of pressure for that coach to play you. And you saw what happened with Jared Goff last year in L.A. He wasn't ready, and they took a lot of guff out there. The natural follow-up, and it's away from the guys at the Pro Day, and you may not have been able to see him much. So defer, but Brandon Winbush is now yeah. in the number one slot for Notre Dame. What do you think of him from what you may have been able to see? I don't know anything about him other than when I was doing the Notre Dame games a few years back, they were all excited, the coaches were, about this recruit from New Jersey. And they felt like he had everything from arm strength, athletic ability, leadership especially. They were fired up about Wimbush. Right, back to pro day, Tarian Folston, the running back. Yeah, you know, when he was a freshman here and I was doing the games, I thought he had a little bit of a natural feel for running back. Just a, a, Some guys get it. They don't have to think it. They're just natural, and I thought he had some of that. Obviously, he got hurt. I think it was week one against Texas in 15, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly. Uh, came back this past year, somewhat mixed results. Came out today. I was hoping he would really burst a little bit today. He was 5'9", 199. I had him in 4.77 and 4.79 in his 40s, which is – not good for a running back. So uh, he's going to struggle. He's, he's not going to get drafted. Uh, he's going to have to be a priority free agent in the camp, and he's going to have to show people he can catch the football, which I think he can. He's going to have to play special teams. Right now it's a little bit of a long shot for him, 
Um, but I hope we'll show up and get an opportunity. Defensive lineman Isaac Rochelle. I saw Isaac yesterday, and he's changed his body. He's changed his diet. He's, he's actually taken off a lot of weight. Yeah. He was uh, 6'4", 273 today, down seven pounds from the combine, not able to work out because of the hamstring he pulled in the combine. Uh, coaches and scouts like him because he works. You know, he's got a long body. He can play defensive end in your base package. Some teams might even kick him in on sub packages. Uh, but he's a worker bee, and he's a long body, good size worker, and those guys typically play in the league for a while. So I'm, I'm rooting for Isaac Rochelle. Defensive lineman Jerron Jones. Yeah. Mixed opinions around the league on Jerron. And he's a, he's a, you know, you look at him, he's 6'5 and a half, 310 pounds. He's got really long arms, which is important in a defensive line. And he flashes on tape. And if, if he could have replicated the way he played against Miami every week, we'd be talking about him a different way today. But he didn't. He's a highly inconsistent player that flashes on tape. Um, he flashes in his workout. He didn't, he didn't run well today. I had him in 5'4", five, 5'5", five in his 40, which is worse than he did at the combine. Uh, the pro scouts worked him out. The defensive line coaches worked him out. It was tough for him because he was by himself. You usually like to have three or four guys rotating yeah. in. So he was gassed today. So he'll be, he'll be drafted, and he's, a, he's probably going to be a five technique for one of those teams. He's got a body that he looks a little bit like Stefan Tuitt as far as body type is concerned. He just doesn't have the consistency yet of a Stefan Tuitt. A guy who, believe it or not, actually co-hosted this show in the fall. Jack tries to get a student athlete or two Smart. on the show. Yep. Uh, linebacker James Onwalu. He's one of my favorites this year, and uh, I watched him closely at the East-West game. And the East-West game is more for the mid to late round than free agent guys. And he came in like it was a job interview, and he went to work every day, and he did it the right way. And I remember talking to him on the practice field before or after a practice and just being impressed with the kid, and that's important also. So he presents well. He plays hard. What's his fit in the NFL? He probably won't get drafted. If he does, it'll be late, sixth, seventh round. But if he doesn't get drafted, I still think he's going to make a team. And the reason is I think he'll be a core special teams player, and I think he can play sub-linebacker. So I, I think he's the kind of guy that one way or another is going to get into camp and stick. Is there a similarity between him and a guy that I was convinced uh, was going to catch on last year, and he did, Matthias Farley? Yeah, I think there are some similarities. And in, in, in the NFL, the more you can do, you know, if, if you're not a, a top first, second, third round pick that they're hoping will start day one, you, you're going to have to be a special teams player. And, and that's where the safeties and linebackers really come into play. So Anawalu is 228 pounds. He ran in the mid four sevens, which I was happy with today. He jumped 36 inches, which surprised me, which is really good. So he's going to get on a practice field and in a preseason game, and what he's going to have to do is buy into the fact that his future is tied to his performance on special teams. And what happens with these guys, if they can string two or three years together as good special teams players, they often work their way into the lineup. They buy themselves time to develop into a good linebacker. Cornerback Cole Luke. Yeah, Cole Luke uh, was 5'11", 198 today. Um, was hoping to see him run faster. I had him at 4.61 and 4.63. I was hoping he'd be at least 4.55 or better. Uh, I thought he worked out well. I, I think he's, he, he's got some quickness to him. So I think he's quicker than he is fast. Again, will he get drafted? Borderline. Sixth or seventh round at best. Probably a priority free agent. But again, he's going to have to get into camp, play special teams, and compete. A guy who had a, a star-crossed collegiate career both at Cal and Notre Dame with a lot of injuries. Safety, Avery Sebastian. Yeah. I haven't seen any of his tape because he was a transfer this year and, and he had the injury bug. And uh, I was anxious to watch him. He's really rocked up, got a great build. But I had him at 4'9 and 4'88, which for a defensive back doesn't, necess doesn't very often translate to the NFL. So I, I was sitting with the scouts when we were timing everybody, and, and they were disappointed in that time. Tight end Chase Hounshell. Another guy that uh, obviously spent his last year at Ohio State, didn't play much for them at all. Came back today, 6'4 and a half, 245, ran in the five, 5 range. I think he'll get a shot in camp, and, and really what he's going to have to do is block people. I mean, he's really going to have to be physical. I've been fascinated in the last 5 to 10 years about how 
There's now an industry of long snapper coaches, and it's a way to specialize <laughs> and get yourself yep. to the NFL. Yep. And Scott Daly seems to be stepping into a line of guys who specialized early and has a real shot. Do you agree? It's interesting, and, and I don't evaluate long snappers or kickers because that would be like me evaluating Tiger Woods' golf swing. You know, I, I, I'm not, I don't understand the whole program. <laughs> I talk to my special teams buddies about it. But if you go back to one of my Boston College teammates was a guy named Steve Diossi, who played for the Giants, and his son Zach played at Brown University and has played for the Giants for the last eight or ten years as a long snapper only. And he's one of those guys that leads a team in tackles from long snapping. Daly's got the size. He's 250 pounds. He ran okay, 505, 508 in that area. So if you can be a consistent long snapper, you can play a lot of years in this league and, and have a pretty good living. Mike, I really enjoyed this. Thank you for the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, man. All right. Mike Mayock, everybody, back with more on the Jack Swarbrick Show right after this. Just hearing the crowd it makes you want to bring your game to the next level and finish the job. That's what you play for. You play for those great atmospheres because that's kind of what we work for. It's we work for those big plays and those big games. You're going to get the chances. You know you're going to get them if we run on offense. I just kind of dig into all the emotions. Every game matters so much. It means so much to more than just you. I mean, we're the fighting Irish. Seven seconds to go. Mikey wins. 